So cool. um, I'm I'm just delighted that uh, that you're willing and able to have this conversation because sure. um, this topic of the future calling us to greatness. Uh, the, the longer version is the past is rooting for us and the future is calling us to greatness. And it's just giving me a great opportunity to talk with people like yourself who've been doing a lot of thinking and writing and speaking on this, uh, the topic of humanity's relationship to the, the world and the future. And so I'd like to be, I'd like to uh, begin by some people who aren't going to be as familiar as others in terms of your work, your uh, accomplishments, your contributions. So could you just give our viewers and listeners a sense of uh, who James Howard Kunstler is and what you've, what you've what you've contributed uh, and what you're passionate about. Well, I, I like to call myself a full service writer. Um, I've published about, I don't know, 17, 18 books, um, about 11 or 12 or more of them. I've lost count are n novels and uh, uh, another whole bunch of them are nonfiction. Um, a lot of those novels were my uh, kind of early uh, first phase of my career and uh, they're not too well known. They're mostly out of print. Uh, I, uh, I guess I started to come to the public's attention with a book published in, eight, in 1993 called The Geography of Nowhere. And that was an examination of the fiasco of suburbia, as I like to call it. That uh, got me involved with uh, a reform organization, um, uh, a reform movement called the New Urbanism. And uh, I wrote a couple more books uh, on the subject of the human habitat in America, you know, how to, how to remedy the fiasco of suburbia. Uh, that was the subject of a book called Home from Nowhere. And then I wrote a book called The City in Mind, Notes on the Urban Condition. And that was sort of a discussion of exactly what the subtitle says. And... Um, in the course of doing that, uh, you know, I couldn't fail to notice that we were uh, running into a problem with fossil fuels uh, as the way that we ran our living arrangement. And uh, at the same time, in the, in the mid-90s, something happened. Uh, a group of senior geologists started to drop out, uh, retire from the oil industry, and they started to publish their dark and secret thoughts about mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they might have just remained in obscure journals and monographs, but uh, the phenomenon of the Internet was rising at the same time. And these ideas, which really came to be called peak oil, came to the, the, the attention of a lot of people uh, and spread through the Internet. And... Um, I think a good thing that they did because uh, we were indeed facing a pretty serious predicament with our uh, the way the the question of how we were going to run this uh, society that we have ramped up. Yeah. So um, that prompted me to to uh, write a book called The Long Emergency, which came out finally in two thousand five. Yeah, and, and that was a Jim. Let, let me just jump in for one second and say I'm that, sorry if I'm going on too. Long. No, 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 no. This is great. But I just wanted to mention that uh, Connie and I, my wife and I, travel all over North America, speaking in churches and colleges and that sort of thing. And the, the main way we keep ourselves in gas and food money, in addition to the honoraria, is by selling uh, what we consider the cream of the crop in terms of books and DVDs related to the topics that we speak oh. about. And so your book, The Long Emergency, has actually kept thank us you. in gas and food money. So thank you. Well, thank you. I guess it's kept me in the little gas and food money, too, so good for both of us. While the gas lasts. Yeah. So I wrote that book, and it got a certain amount of attention, and, uh, you know, I hasten to add that a number of other people wrote books about uh, the same issues, uh, you know, in, a, in their own style around the same time. Richard Heinberg published mm -hmm. The Party's Over, and... Um, a chap at USC, a, phys a physicist, wrote another good one. I think his, uh, his name escapes me at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a number of other people were writing about this subject. And so uh, people started to become aware of it. So after I wrote that, I wrote a, I wrote a couple of novels uh, set in the American post-petroleum future. The first was called World Made by Hand, and the second was called... The Witch of Hebron, and I've just finished the third of what will be four altogether, 
uh, one for each of the four seasons. So the third one will come out in September of 2014. It's called A History of the Future. And then, uh, based on what I was seeing around the country, because I travel a lot too, um, after the lung emergency came out, uh, I became aware of the fact that, that the delusional thinking in the United States was, ex- was extraordinary. We were going through a really uh, amazing period of, uh, of uh, uh, delusional thinking, basically believing in things that aren't true. Well, especially, um, especially the, what, uh, what the you and John Michael Greer both refer to as sort of the myth of perpetual progress. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so, well, I wrote a book about that uh, uh, particular problem that was called Too Much Magic. Mm-hmm. And the subtitle of that was uh, Technology, Wishful Thinking, and the Fate of the Nation. Because mm-hmm. it seemed to me that, you know, the whole country was sitting around waiting for some, uh, some Silicon Valley geek to invent a rescue remedy so we could keep on driving to Walmart forever. And that's what I consider the master wish. I call that the master wish Hmm. in America today, uh, which is to keep driving to Walmart forever. Um, We're going to be disappointed about how that works out. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to answer the call of history. So far, Hmm. we're a little bit too preoccupied with the Kardashians and and other Hmm. trivialities. I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that I've appreciated about your work a little bit in the long emergency, but also in some of the other works you mentioned, is your critique of suburbia and uh, promoting of a much more simple community-based lifestyle. Could you say a little bit about that? Um, yes, yeah, suburbia can be defined in many ways, but uh, th- there are two ways that I think are important if you're really going to understand it. One is... It's the, it's the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. And another way of understanding it is it's a living arrangement with no future. Uh, now, unfortunately, America is kind of stuck with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one, one of the missing modules of a liberal education these days is the idea that life is tragic. And um, by that, I don't mean that... that Everything has an unhappy ending. Um, I mean that uh, there are consequences if you make bad decisions. And America's made a a lot of bad decisions. Now, uh, I hasten to add also that that was not necessarily, you know, the decision to build suburbia was not uh, really a conspiracy. It it was more of a consensus than a conspiracy. And all that says is, you know, uh, societies can make poor choices collectively, Mm -hmm. and we did. And, uh, uh, but now we're kind of stuck with it, and it has, it has provoked what I call a psychology of previous investment, Mm -hmm. meaning that we've put so much of our national treasure into this way of life with no future that we can't imagine letting go of it or reforming it or, or getting away from it. I think what's going to happen is, uh, going to surprise people. Well, Many of them may be surprised at the failure of suburbia. And, of course, it has three destinies for the most part. Slums, uh, salvage, and ruins. Uh, Some of it is going to be retrofitted and fixed, but most of it won't. Um, The cities are going to get in as much trouble as the suburbs because they've gotten too big. And they're not scaled to the energy and capital formation realities of the future. So... We're going to see them contract uh, hugely, and that's going to be that, that will entail a whole lot of social distress and loss of wealth and, and political problems. But where will everybody end up? You know, my notion is this: is that be, because we're going to also get into a lot of trouble with industrial agriculture, uh, th- uh, that food production uh, is is going to have to change. We're going to, we're obviously going to have to do that differently, and. Um, Like all the other uh, parts of the predicament that we're faced with, it implies downscaling and relocalizing everything we do. And and so that as that occurs, I I think you'll you'll see several phenomena. One is that um, the places that have a meaningful relationship with farming are going to regain importance. Right. Uh, In uh, I, I think that the that farming and food production and the activities that grow out of that are going to 
um, come closer to the center of economic life than they have in generations. I agree. And uh, I think that a lot of our small towns, the places that are in the, the worst kind of desolation and disinvestment now are going to revive. Yeah. Um, I don't think that everybody's going to flee suburbia and move to the city. In fact, if that happens, it would be that would be yet another tragedy. Yeah. Because places like Dallas and Minneapolis and you know Atlanta and and you name it, you know, a, a lot of you know, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. A very nice fellow named David Owen, who writes for the New Yorker, um, wrote a piece about I don't know eight or ten years ago to the effect that Manhattan was the greenest living arrangement in, in the USA. Well, it's just not true. It would be nice to think so, right. but his idea was that if you could stack people up in, you know, 70-story skyscrapers, they would just occupy a smaller footprint. But it ain't going to work out that way. Well, you know, what we're going to discover, first of all, is that skyscrapers or towers or, or megastructures, whatever you want to call them, are obsolete and, and not not only because of the, uh, you know, the electrical requirements for heating and ventilation and air conditioning. Well, not so much heating, but air conditioning and ventilation. And, you know, the elevators, uh, you know, require very little energy, actually, in point of fact. The reason that they're going to be obsolete is that uh, the capital and the resources won't be there to renovate them ever again. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a bunch of, you know, Manhattan is full of buildings that seem to be great right now. But they will, they will turn out to be white elephants. They're going to turn out to be liabilities, not assets. And this will come as a complete surprise and shock to 99.9% .9 of the educated people in New York, including the architects. And, of course, the architects have an interest in, uh, uh, as they say, maximizing the Florida area ratio of a given building lot. So, you know, they're delighted to build skyscrapers because they're – you know, their commissions multiply exponentially. Yeah. But they are, you know, again, life is tragic. And just because we do stupid things doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, we get away with it. Yeah. Eventually, there are consequences. So that was a very long-winded answer to your question. No, that's okay. Um, one of the things that I found as I, taught, as I talked to people about these issues, peak oil, climate change, some of the, as you say, converging crises uh, of the 21st century, is that, you know, if you don't buy this sort of this idea that things are going to just keep getting better and better and technologies are, you know, going to save our ass, you're almost immediately lumped into the camp of... Um, uh, doomer. Yeah, exactly. Doom and gloomer or apocalyptic yeah. person. And there's Well, a... that, that's partly because we live in a culture where it's more important to make people feel good than it is to get, get in, in tune with reality. Yeah. Well, I agree. And so could you just distinguish for our viewers and listeners a little bit um, the difference between sort of uh, what I would say is a sobering assessment of trends that are clearly coming down the pike and what we're likely to experience in the next decade and much further out. The distinction between that and the sort of apocalyptic end of the world kind of thing. Well, the reason I wrote my world made by hand novels was to uh, uh, depict a post-petroleum world that would not be so terrible. Yeah. Um, it's, still, it's still much harsher than most people would care for. You know, the electricity is not on and the Internet is no longer with us and people aren't ordering a lot of stuff from William sonoma but, um, you know, they're managing to live in a new and different economy, an economy which in many ways has kind of uh, returned to uh, uh, older models of, mm -hmm. uh, of human activity. And, uh, you know, they still find joy. They still find purpose in life, perhaps even more than they did before in the, you know, the, the vacuum of anime that is a uh, diminishing return of all the technological crap that we surround ourselves with. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, personally, I believe that we probably that that that's the most plausible future for us if we don't blow ourselves up or you know outside of some other uh, black swan kind of thing. But I would also um, uh, caution people to, to to reflect on the 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 idea that uh, you know the, there's there's your individual point of view, which is how you're disposed to think about where you're at in history or in your own community or in your country. But then there's the whole question of the consensus. And I'm very concerned about the consensus more than, you know, whether individual people uh, are gloomy or pessimistic or, 
You know, it's more a question of what are we going to do collectively? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of evidence out there that we're doing a pretty poor job of, mm-hmm. uh, of standing up for the future. My, you know, one of, one of the ones that I uh, discuss a lot is the fact that we desperately need to rebuild the conventional railroad system in America. Mm-hmm. Because the likelihood is that commercial aviation is not going to be what it has been for us. Uh, you know, I think that in 10, 15 years, it'll disappear altogether. The commercial model uh, for running it has already failed. You know, all of these companies have been in and out of, in and out of bankruptcy, and they can't uh, do that. Uh, you know, they, they, they can't, probably can't merge more times. They've, uh, they've done all the mergers. They've fired all the non-essential employees. They've offloaded all the pensions, you know. So they, I don't think they can do much more of that. And uh, so we're going to see that wither. I don't think there's any question that the happy motoring, uh, mass motoring system is going to wither and, and uh, go away. And by the way, we need to understand that it's not just about the fuel that you put in the vehicle. So these uh, quixotic uh, ventures like Elon Musk's Tesla venture, w- which is another exercise in techno-narcissism and delusional thinking and wishful thinking, you know, the idea that we're going to electrify the um, whole automobile system is, is uh, uh, not consistent with reality. It ain't going to happen. But a better way of understanding this is, is also getting with the program uh, and understanding that Happy motoring will probably fail on the financial basis before it even fails on the fuel basis Mm. because we are now having so many problems with capital formation at $100 plus a barrel oil that the money to loan people for buying cars is not going to be there for car loans. And that's how Americans are used to buying cars. And so what you'll see is incrementally – uh, fewer and fewer Americans, and by the way, th- this uh, is accompanied by you know the impoverishment of the middle class. Fewer and fewer Americans will be able to buy vehicles the way Americans have been used to doing it for seventy years, and uh, you know that that'll probably be the 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 really the key thing. The, another element of it that people don't consider is that um, uh, m- many, if not most, or all municipalities are either broke or strapped for, for money, and uh, as is, are the state governments and the federal government is, you know, t- I probably make a case that is technically bankrupt. Um, and I don't think we're going to be able to keep maintaining this elaborate network of roadways that we have built over the last hundred years. So that's an additional problem. You know, we're going to see a triage of the road system, we're going to have to make choices about which roads get resurfaced and which ones we right. just forget about, right. which bridges, etc. So anyway, I, that's another long-winded answer. So there you yeah. go. Well, no, this is good, Jim. One of the things that I'd like to sort of help our, our audience get a sense of, I mean, for you and I, we've been reading a lot and speaking on peak oil, but for some people that are part of this, because this series is being produced by an organization that's done a lot of personal growth and empowerment kinds of stuff, there may be some people that just really need a, you know, peak oil 101, sort of a, like, why, why is this guy sound so doom and gloomy? Why, you like, how, you know, it's for somebody who doesn't get these challenges, these trends, peak oil and others, could you just sort of give a, um, and take as long as you want to, but, but give sort of the elementary version of why, the, the, the next 10 or 20 years is not likely to be rosy and it's likely to be very, very challenging and it's, it's, give some sense of why that's the case for people who aren't up well, to speed it, on Well, it, it, it's really pretty simple. You know, we have constructed an infrastructure for daily life that depends on petroleum and uh, petroleum is just getting more expensive and there's a certain threshold above which it, uh, the, the economy just doesn't work, and we're at that threshold. Um, uh, we're at a point of, of that threshold where it's showing up mostly in the financial system because the financial system being the most abstract and um, uh, uh, sort of the most abstract and the most fragile of our systems is, is the first one that is likely to wobble 
Mm-hmm. And it is. And, you know, that's visible in the, uh, you know, the 2008 um, uh, crash and all of the things that have emanated out of it, including the machinations by the uh, banking system and the Federal Reserve and other authorities to try to uh, offset our, uh, our inability to, uh, to grow in the conventional way anymore economically with, uh, by just issuing more and more fake money. Right. So, well, you know, the financial system is really uh, th- th- the canary in the coal mine, but it's also such a powerful part of daily life that if it fails, you know, a lot of other things going to fail too. Yeah. Really, you have all of these systems that are tied together. They're, you know, you have a, basically a network of complex systems that are tied together, and, and you, can, you can describe them with precision. There's nothing metaphysical about it. There's the agriculture system, you know, agribiz or industrial agriculture. If that fails, then people are going to starve. There's a transportation system. You know, if we can't get on airplanes and drive our cars, you know, we're not going anywhere in a very large continental nation. There's the commerce system, which today mostly uh, is represented by big box shopping and Walmart. You know, we got we to gotta, uh, uh, reimagine that and rebuild that. And, you know, the mall of the future is probably going to be Main Street. Most of America doesn't know that. Most of America doesn't understand how fragile Walmart is. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all these systems are interdependent. And uh, if, they, if they all go down or, fo- or fall apart fairly rapidly, it's going to cause a lot of disorder in American life and both social and polit- political disorder. And I think that that's self-explanatory. You know, if it gets really bad, then you're living in a very, very bad period of history. So um, as for the oil itself, I have found that there's a very simple way to present uh, uh, an understanding of the difference between where we were at before and where we're at now, okay? okay. And it's as simple as this. Uh, the conventional oil before the 21st century, that let's say you have East Texas sweet, light, crude oil. It costs $400,000 in today's money to drill a well for that. It comes on the, on, out of the ground under its own pressure, you don't have to go in there and goose it out in any way. It doesn't require anything. And it produces thousands of barrels a day for 30 years. That's what we, were, that's what we had to work with from about 1900 until about 2005. Okay? Now we have something else. You know, we're depending on unconventional oil as represented by, say, the North Dakota Bakken shale oil. Okay. Now that stuff takes... Uh, it costs between six to twelve million dollars to drill a Bakken well in today's money, as opposed to four hundred thousand dollars. You have to go through elaborate uh, fracking procedures to goose the oil out of the tight rock. It produces, on average, a hundred barrels a day per well, and only for the first year because it falls by at least half the first year, and three years later it's out. Wow. So you compare, you know, 30 years of thousands of barrels of oil a day from each well with four years of, you know, 100 barrels a day or less with tremendous co- costs associated with it. There's no comparison. And I think what we'll see is that we were able to ramp up this, this shale thing as a kind of desperate demonstration project, but it, it ain't going to pencil out economically. Right. And sooner or later, it will be starved for capital to continue doing these operations. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Well, Jim, this can be, for somebody who hasn't already allowed themselves to feel the anger, the grief, the sadness, or the emotions that come with realizing that our sort of American fantasy uh, cannot continue, and not just American, but global um, sort of industrial way of being, uh, that can be pretty overwhelming and scary. What is, what is it that inspires you or gives you hope, or at least what is it that keeps you waking up each day to contribute toward a healthy future, to playing some role in that process? Well, first of all, um, I'm by disposition, I'm a cheerful person. You know, I'm not prone to being a depressive. Um, I, I lead a very purposeful life, uh, and um, which is something that a lot of uh, Americans, for one reason or another, have not managed to be able to find their way to do. 
um, in our ridiculous culture and ridiculous economy and this, you know, this society of clowns that we're now living in. And it's, that's unfortunate. But again, life is tragic. Um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, like, I like to write and I like to write my books and I like to write my blog and I like to, to uh, do all this stuff. I, you know, I have a certain malicious sense of humor that keeps me going and I like to uh, piss people off and make them laugh. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I get a kick out of that. I like to get paid, and, uh, you know, I get paid for writing. I don't get paid a huge amount. You know, I'm not rich, but uh, I like that. I've made certain choices in my own life that are, uh, you know, that are working out okay. Um, I live on three acres. I, I have uh, planted uh, about 30 fruit trees, including just this week uh, five new plum trees. Six oh, really? new plum trees, actually. Wow. Yeah. And, and you, you um, live you live for for people who don't know it you live in uh, sort of northeast of Albany uh, south of yeah, Lake I Champlain. Yeah, I live wedged wedged up between uh, between Saratoga Springs and the Vermont border, north yeah. of Albany. Yeah. And uh, you know we we ha- we're having our first spring day today, as a matter of fact. And I was out in the garden um, just a few minutes ago before we started talking. Uh, you know, getting the hoses out and and mm-hmm. uh, putting the snow blower back in the shed and you know, bringing other stuff out. And, um, you know, and I, I, I like what I'm doing. I like gardening. I like growing, uh, planting and growing fruit trees. I, I like the prospect of all of this. I, I'm doing this on a piece of property that is actually uh, off the last street in a little factory village in upstate New York. It's a village of about 2,500 people. It, the economy is completely shot. Mm-hmm. You know, there used to be three factories here, and now they're all gone. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't really know what most of the people do. I think a lot of them, uh, you know, are on, on a government dole of one kind or another. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty pathetic, you know. The, the backwaters of America are beginning to look like, uh, you know, Kazakhstan or Poland or in, the, you know, in, in the 1980s or some kind of desperate, impoverished backwater of civilization. And, and you know, the... Uh, the denizens of, of many places in America are beginning to show that, too. You know, they're turning, turning into tattooed savages. Yeah. Well, you know, as you were speaking before about the various uh, sectors and the challenges that they have and how fragile they are, it reminded me of another one of the books that Connie and I sell that, uh, uh, after our programs uh, by D- Dmitry Orlov. Uh, oh, that's a fabulous book. Yeah. He's a fabulous writer. Yeah, he is. He is. The Five Stages of Collapse. And, um, I mean, he, he's, a, he's really a true artist, a true prose artist. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the cockroaches who are, will be the librarians of the future will, you know, I think he'll be one of the major writers of our time. Mm-hmm. Well, and the fact that he's, you know, experienced uh, various forms of collapse in the Soviet Union and or is yeah. able to share from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, I find your writings, uh, his, uh, John Michael Greer, Richard Heinberg, to be sort of the most sobering and yet also strangely hopeful in the sense that um, this diluted way we've been living is not sustainable. It can't continue. It's wreaking havoc with the planet, with other species, and uh, it has to shift. In fact, I've come to call what we're up against, that we've been out of right relationship to reality. And I use the words, when I speak in religious audiences, I use the words God and reality interchangeably, that reality is a mythic name, I mean, or is a secular name for what ancients meant when they used the word God. And that sure. we've, been out, we've been out of right relationship to reality, and we are about to experience the great reckoning. And yeah. there's going to be a cost and consequence. It's not because some supernatural deity has singled us out to punish us, it's that we've been out of alignment with the way things really are and are now about to experience that and hopefully my vision is that it will be also the the great homecoming humanity coming back into right relationship to reality even if it takes some hundreds of years um Uh could you say a little bit uh, about sort of the vision of how you see because again this is scary stuff for people who haven't spent some time with it so as you imagine a a a post-petroleum community-based lifestyle Give us a sense of a typical day or a typical week in that kind of a context. Well, the people in the uh, fictional town that I've created in the World Made by Hand series are, you know, they're living in a small town. The population has been reduced by repeated epidemics. Um, They have lost a lot, including a lot of knowledge, but they have still retained some important things. You know, the, the, the village doctor still knows enough to wash his hands before he performs an operation so you know he's still ahead of where they were in 1863 Um, 
the uh, uh, you know there's no internet to rely on. Uh, they even have problems with things like clocks because um, there's only one guy in town who knows how to repair regular mechanical clocks, and they're a little hard to come by. Mm. Um, and he goes around, uh, you know, he keeps he he has old back copies of the almanacs, and so he has a sort of a, an idea of what time it is on a given day of the year when the sun comes up, and he goes around adjusting everybody else's clocks. One of one of the criticisms that I got from uh, readers, well, I don't know if it's a criticism, but they were disappointed that I did not depict uh, the the future as a utopia of bicycling. Mm. And the reason for that was pretty simple. I you know I don't think that we're going to have the kind of advanced alloy metals that that are required to make the sort of bicycles that people take for granted nowadays. You know, which actually require a lot of advanced metallurgy, yeah. uh, as well as rubber. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think that we're just not going to have the, you know, the uh, uh, material for that. Oh, what's more, the uh, in World Made by Hand and, and it's the other books, I depict the pavements and the roadways as being pretty bad, pretty yeah. broken up. Yeah. You know, there's nobody who's been fixing them for quite a while. It doesn't take long in my part of the country for the pavements to really yeah. completely go to hell. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these people... Uh, uh, I depict the economy as being uh, uh, centered on the ag- on agriculture. The the people who are wealthy in that new society are the the successful farmers who um, have you know as I imagined it acquired a lot more land and uh, have found a new way of organizing labor. And there are about two or three different models in in the books. Uh, one of them is represented by a kind of snarky uh, uh, gentleman named Mr. Bullock, who is basically a fe- has become a feudal lord. Mm-hmm. He has taken into his taken into his sort of uh, care uh, and keeping about sixty uh, people who have lost their vocations and their way of life. You know, the people, the pharmacists who no longer can be pharmacists, and the you know the insurance salesmen who, in an economy with you know no insurance salesmen. You know, so these guys are now working on his farm, and he's allowed them to build a village for themselves on this property, which is, and he's acquired a lot of the property of the failed farmers around him. So that's one model. Yeah. He's a kind of a reluctant despot. Uh, not all bad, but what I wanted to illustrate there was that you know one of the things that could come out of this would be kind of a new form of feudalism, mm-hmm. in which people uh, sell their allegiance to. Uh, somebody with land and somebody with uh, with uh, power for shelter and food mm-hmm. and a way of life. And mm-hmm. you know, another another element of th- that part of the story is that these people are very conscious of the fact that um, uh, the other amenity that they get with shelter and food is they lead an ordered existence. Mm-hmm. You know, they know. Uh, you know, they know what they're going to do from day to day. They know who to answer to. There's a hierarchy. I had to really thrash out some, you know, kind of sticky issues of hierarchy and authority. Mm. Because in our current egalitarian society, right. um, <laughs> you know, where, where nobody, in, there's, there, you know, there is very, very little respect for authority, really. And no sense that, it is, that either A, it's necessary, or B, that there may even be some good things about it. Right. You know, we're going to find out that actually uh, you probably do need somebody to tell other people what to do. Exactly. Now, there's, you know, there's a lot of space between, you know, a local, uh, you know, a local farming honcho and Adolf Hitler, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But, but there's also, you know, in, in World Made by Hand 3, the, the book that's coming out in um, September, one of the central uh, episodes takes place uh, where one of my characters has left town and traveled to the center of the country to a breakaway white supremacist nation that calls itself the Foxfire Republic, run by a former country western singer slash evangelist lady, um, who I who I have described as Dolly Parton meets Hitler. Oh God! So. You know, that's one possible outcome. And, you know, I've alluded to that in, in several of my books. And, uh, you know, I, I call that uh, corn-pone Nazism. 
And that's certainly a possibility in the mm. United States. Just because we haven't experienced it so far doesn't mean that in an emergency or a long period of hardship right. that Amer – you know, my, my own sense of things is that Americans have been so careless and so lax and so complacent and so foolish that we will reach a certain inflection point where they will beg somebody to push them around and tell them what to do. Yeah. And that could be a great danger to us politically. Yeah, well, I mean, that was depicted in the, in the movie uh, uh, V for Vendetta. Well, I guess it was. Yeah, I, I don't remember it that well. And that took place in England. Yeah, right. No, exactly. Yeah. Well, Jim, what do you see being done? And I, I, I would have difficulty answering this question myself because I don't, see as, I don't see a whole lot of really great things being done. But what are some things uh, that are being done that give you some sense of hope or at least is in the right direction? And then what would you suggest are some of the biggest things that we need to do and need to do soon? I think very little is being done. Uh, you know, I think the, the idea that we're going to run Walmart, Walt Disney World, suburbia, the U.S. military, and the interstate highway system on renewable energy is uh, a joke. It ain't going to happen. We have to change our living arrangements drastically, and we're not interested in having that conversation. So, so right now, I think you can state, you know, um, with the exception of a few activists and, tr and transition town people and, you know, a small, tiny minority of the American public who's interested uh, and paying attention, we're not really doing anything. And as a matter of consensus, meaning, uh, you know, a, a, an agreed upon uh, agenda, you know, there's absolutely nothing going on. Yeah. Um, I, I return to this thing about the railroad system. Um, that is a no-brainer. It would, it would be relatively compared to the other things that we fantasize about, you know, like uh, the electric car and, and all of that. We desperately need to fix the conventional railroad system. We're not going to build a high-speed system. We missed the window of opportunity for that. We're now in the scarce capital situation, despite the BS that you hear about liquidity and a lot of, you know, fast money uh, and hot money traveling around the world looking for investment. Um, in, in point of fact, we're starved for real investment money. And um, it's desperately important that we do that. But the idea has not even entered the political arena from people you'd think would be interested. You know, where's Bernie Sanders on that issue? You know, where are the, re where are the so-called uh, self-identified progressives? They're not talking about that. We, that issue has got to be dragged into the political arena real fast. And the fact that we're not doing it shows we are a completely unserious people and a completely unserious nation. Unser so, unserious or perhaps addicted. Well, uh, you know, to me, the, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we're I, addicted to television. We're addicted to news. I mean, all, yeah, these, things, that gets into the, all these things that play on our instincts, uh, the, the, the whole 24 news cycle and uh, internet porn and internet gaming and television and just there's so many things that we're evolutionarily programmed to pay attention to and to want that uh, our time and energy is wasted and we can ignore the really important things because we're t paying attention to episodic trivia. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I think the reality-based answer to that is boo-hoo, okay? Boo-hoo. Uh, uh, you know, this is not the time to be a crybaby. You know, uh, we may be depraved on account of we're deprived or deprived on account of we're depraved, to uh, quote that old uh, line from West Side Story. Um, but, you know, this is not, a, we, don't have, we don't have time to be crybabies anymore. And one of, the, the, one of the really harsh answers to that, which people really don't want to hear, is that Americans have to man up. Mm. You know, we have to break out of what has become a feminized, uh, culture in which making people feel good about stuff is more important than doing stuff. Mm. We've got to uh, get back in touch with the idea that um, uh, uh, it's not the thought that, that counts, that wishing for something is not the same thing as, account as accomplishing it. And unfortunately, you know, that's the kind of culture we're stuck in. And um, I don't see any prospects that uh, we're going to break out of that right away. Yeah. And if we do, you know, it's going to be very, it's going to be very hard. I, I got a lot of, I got a lot of flack from uh, female readers about the social disposition of things in world made by hand because, you know, I came to the conclusion 
uh, you know, whether it makes people feel good or, or not, that um, the feminist revolution is probably not going to continue as it's currently being experienced, you know, for, for certain practical reasons. There will be no more glass ceilings to break through. You know, the gigantic armature of institutional and corporate life is probably going to crumble. And we're not going to be living and working in those kinds of large organizations. Um, we're also going to be in a situation where a lot of work cannot just be done by anybody. It's probably going to be, you know, we're probably going to see gender-based work assignments again that, that are going to, you know, disturb people. But, you know, that's the reality-based future that we're moving into. And I'm sorry if it makes some people feel bad, but, you know, boo-hoo. Yeah. Well, Jim, how did you get to give give us a sense of your trajectory? Like, when you know a, a little piece of your you know, of your life story. I mean, not the whole thing, obviously, but just how did you come to have the engagements, the passion, the involvements that you now have? Give us a little sense of that trajectory. Uh, my my parents moved out to the Long Island suburbs in 1954, and I experienced that as a child from the age of uh, five to the age of eight. My parents split up, and I moved into the middle of Manhattan with my mom. So uh, the rest of my childhood was spent in the biggest city in the United States with all of its uh, charms and attractions and, and drawbacks, et cetera, mm -hmm. and all of its cultural opportunities and all of its uh, cultural liabilities. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up in New York, especially when I was a teenager, the only things that I really wanted to do were the things I couldn't do. I wanted to go bass fishing ride motorcycles and, and go out with girls named Alice. And the only thing I could do in New York City was go to museums or Yankee Stadium and, and date girls who didn't have any vowels in their names. So, uh, you know, there, there, were, there were drawbacks to that. Um, I went to college because I was a bad student in high school. I went to college in a little rum dum campus of the State University of New York in western New York. But I actually loved it. I loved being away from New York City. I love being in the province, uh, provinces, and I, love, I fell in love with small-town Main Street America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I lived there for a while. A after college, I lived in a bunch of cities. I was a journalist, so I lived in, uh, I lived in Boston, Washington, San Francisco. Uh, and um, I dropped out of corporate journalism in the 70s. I, I figured I got about as far as I was going to get uh, being an editor at Rolling Stone magazine, mm -hmm. and I dropped out to write books, and I moved to a Main Street town in, in upstate New York called Saratoga Springs, uh, where I hunkered down to be a starving bohemian, and I wasn't uh, disappointed because I was still waiting on tables after my eighth book came out. I published eight novels, and I was still waiting on tables. So, which illustrates something that I tell wannabe writers, uh, you know, who ask me, you know, how do I become a writer? And I tell them, I give them the, uh, I give them the, uh, the difficult news to digest <laughs> that perseverance counts even more than talent. <laughs> well, yeah. I, and, uh, I mean, anyway, then, I, you know, from there on, I just kept on writing books and, you know, here I am. I, I was in Saratoga for over 30 years. I moved out here three years ago. Uh, 15 miles east of Saratoga, and that's I'm still in the orbit of that town, which is still a wonderful place to live. Yeah, where did you meet Jennifer on, along that uh, trajectory? Uh, well, uh, actually, I'm divorced from Jennifer. Oh, got it. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I've, I'm divorced from Jennifer, and I've cycled through a couple of girlfriends since that. So, uh, you know, I, I've had a checkered romantic life. But I remain optimistic, you know, uh, uh, you know, as Samuel, was it Samuel Johnson who said about marriage, it was the, uh, about uh, the second or third marriage is a triumph of hope over, uh, uh, I don't know, hope over experience. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. Well, well one, um, of, one of the questions that Connie has uh, given me to uh, ask my guests in this series that I thought was a great one, and she said, don't tell them you're going to ask this beforehand. So that's why I didn't do so. If you had the opportunity to have dinner or, you know, a beer or whatever, but to, to get together and talk over a, a meal or, or a brew or something with three people throughout human history, um, I mean, it could be somebody alive today that you've never met, but, um, but, you know, three people, who would they be and why would you like to have a meal or a beer with them? Hmm. 
Well, I think I would like to have a meal or a beer with um, uh, uh, Julius Caesar, Albert Einstein, and uh, Mark Twain for for uh, for leavening. Somehow I knew you were going to say Twain. I don't know why, but okay. Yeah. So say a little bit about why but, each but, of those. Uh, you know, H.L. Mencken would do as a pinch hitter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because he, you know, he was such a wonderful uh, humorous writer. So, um, so, why, uh, you yeah. know, I think Albert Einstein had Albert Einstein had really the, the the best attitude of any of the major geniuses of human history. He was extremely humble about uh, about himself and about his ideas. Um, you know, he 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 reserved a certain amount of skepticism about uh, what about his own ideas about reality. Um, he had a tremendous compassion for the human race. I'm interested in, hum- in uh, Julius Caesar because he was such an extraordinary leader um, and uh, uh, occupied a tremendous inflection point in yeah. you know, one of the other great civilizations of human history really the great turning point of the Roman Empire, mm-hmm. you know, where it, it went from uh, the Republic to being an empire. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Mark Twain, because, uh, not just because he was a, an amusing, uh, brilliantly amusing fellow, but because he represents a period of American history and Western history that I regard as being the, really the height of civilization. And that is you know the 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 Beaux Arts period of uh, uh, of Western life that uh, ran roughly from about 1890 to the early 1900s, and uh, that was when some of the you know the 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 best things that were ever produced by uh, Western culture were produced. Unfortunately, that era came to an end with the First World War, you know, and the 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 first industrial slaughter of human beings on that scale. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, th- that, uh, I think, m- you know, my theory has always been that World War I was kind of the, the nervous breakdown for industrial civilization. And there was a, a great uh, j- dividing line between what came before and what came after. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- I only want to mention one other thing about history, which I think is important. Um, it's my current, the cat's tail is passing through the camera. Did you see it? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, He's marching around my desk. Um, you know, I've developed a, uh, a new theory of history, and uh, it's pretty simple. You know, people wonder why stuff happens, you know, and I think it's really pretty simple. Mostly things happen for good or for bad and for mega good and for mega bad because they seem like a good idea at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what happened. That's what has happened with us. You know, it seemed like a good idea to build suburbia. It seemed like a good idea to become addicted to uh, petroleum because we, at one point, we seemed to have an endless supply of it. it. Seemed like a good idea to motorize the entire nation and make people dependent on their cars all the time. You know, uh, it seemed like a good idea to get people hooked into the internet so that they. Uh, uh, they're robbed of all the hours of the day when they could be doing real things. But, uh, you know, the, the fact is that these things have all produced tremendous blowback. And part of the blowback is that we've become kind of intellectually crippled to the degree that we don't even see the blowback. Yeah. And we don't, even, we don't understand the diminishing returns and the repercussions and consequences of the bad choices we've made. But as I said, you know, life is tragic, uh, history is merciless, and history doesn't care if we pound our society down a rat hole. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, Jim, for the average person just watching or listening to this, uh, on this theme, because this is one of the things that I come back to in my own work, is helping people have the big picture, uh, to be able to look at the past and the future from a, a large-scale perspective, big history. I, I sometimes call myself a big history evangelist that is sharing this mm-hmm. epic of evolution or, or big history uh, in a way that helps people see that they're part of this enormous, that we are the universe becoming conscious of itself, that we're the, uh, the result of billions of years of creativity, but also billions of years of suffering and struggle and pain, and, you know, that if it weren't for those sacrifices and that struggle, we wouldn't exist. 
So mm-hmm. with some sense of, of, you know, the past, there's actually a meditation that I sometimes do with audiences where I invite them to imagine some being in the past, some ancestor sort of rooting them on and what would they be saying? And then some being a hundred or further years out, uh, that's communicating sort of some encouragement, uh, for how to live and what to be engaged, how to prioritize our lives in this day. So on this theme of the past is rooting for us uh, and the future is rooting or is, is calling us to greatness, how would you speak, like if you were going to offer coaching or a, a piece of advice to some young person watching this or listening to this um, uh, that, that would uh, you know, be an encouragement to, to step into their own greatness or their own contribution or whatever, what would you say to someone? What would you say to a young person today? Well, I, I think that the basis of a purposeful life is just getting your getting your stuff done and making sure that you do it and not making excuses about it. I, I believe that joy and beauty and love are available to us, even in times when uh, when when things seem dark and and harsh. And uh, uh, I believe in uh, in seeking them out and and uh, welcoming them and being ready for them. And um, uh, I guess that's that's about it. You know, I um, uh, we we all uh, you know we all have the same ultimate destination, which is that we return. You know, our spirits and our material constituent parts return to the great uh, ether of uh, of stuff out there. Um, I am aware, generally, although I'm not a religious person. You know, I'm aware of the fact that um, I'm not necessarily the transmitter. I'm the re- I'm I'm just the receiver uh, in the radio, and I I'm I'm not tortured by uh, feelings of you know whether uh, by fears of going to hell or going to judgment or any of those things. I don't think that uh, nature is uh, uh, necessarily benign. Uh, in this sort of mushy sense, but I do have some uh, perhaps irrational uh, feeling that uh, the universe that we matter to the universe, and uh, so I get a lot of consolation from that. What I don't get, what I what I try to avoid is just making excuses for myself, um, wringing my hands and being a crybaby. You know, I'm susceptible to to feeling. Pity for myself, but you know when that happens, you know, like last year when I, they cut my chest open and stopped my heart for four hours, wow. you know, I just, I just said, you know, I'm gonna have a little pity party, boo hoo, and then I'll get over it, and I'll, I'll, you know, and I'll go out and plant some more fruit trees. So that's pretty much my uh, philosophy of life in its own, uh, you know, kind of shredded, uh, ragged presentation. Cool. And, and for somebody wanting to go further into your work, um, your website is just Kunstler.com. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Correct. Great. That's K- yeah, and my, you know, they can just, uh, you know, do a search on Amazon for me and all my books will come out, the ones that are still in print. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I uh, want to remind listeners that World Made by Hand 3 is coming out in September. It's called The History of the Future. And I am now writing World Made by Hand 4, the last of the series, one for each of the four seasons. That's great. Um, and this this uh, interview series will probably air right around Thanksgiving. So actually, it'll already be out by the time most Good. people experience this. There was and one they can the... buy it for Christmas. Yes, exactly. If they have any, if they have any cash left. <laughs> Well, you know, that, that actually, that, that's a perfect segue into what I was, uh, had forgot that I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, you've made some, you know, at your sort of end of year or beginning of year uh, on your, uh, your blog, which is, uh, of course, uh, Clusterfuck Nation, which uh, I love the title. Are we allowed to say that? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think so. But in any case, uh, you know, you've made some, you know, what people would, uh, could, identify as failed uh, projections or failed predictions or whatever. And I, I saw that you just wrote something that was posted up on Chris Martinson's site, but I haven't read it yet. Um, say a little bit about sort of the content of that piece um, and why it's why uh, just because um, uh, predictions or, or um, a sense of what's coming, the timing isn't, isn't perfect, that that doesn't mean we still shouldn't be concerned. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you put yourself out there when you're making predictions about a particular year or something, and, and uh, you know, that, that uh, makes you susceptible to being thought of as a crank or, or an idiot. And, uh, um, but, and I don't, you know, I don't predict too many things specifically. I, I, I do flatly predict the end of commercial aviation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, do th- I had thought that the financial markets and the banks would be in uh, more visible distress sooner than they have been. But there's plenty of time for that to happen. And, uh, you know, I think Chris pretty much says that Chris Martinson himself, uh, uh, whose website I, I often write essays for, um, says it best, you know, that uh, he would rather... He would rather uh, take the risk of looking a little silly um, than, uh, uh, you know, miss the the greater truth in what he's saying. That we do face a series of of uh, cascading interrelated predicaments that are going to change the course of uh, what we think of now as uh, history. You know, this this uh, ceaseless uh, path of uh, technological wondrous magic progress that we think we're on and that things are going to change for a while and that we got to get with reality so i don't know i'm not too disturbed about that i i don't i don't run around with what little hair i have on fire um because people you know think that i'm wrong or they don't want to hear the message or any of that um um I, i I am very interested in what reality has to say to us. I'm more interested in what circumstances are telling us uh, and what events are telling us than whether people are making fun of me. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. So I, I, I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah. And Chris's website is uh, resilience.org. Peak. No, that's oh. uh, Kurt Cobb. Oh. Okay. Uh, what, what 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 what's Chris Martinson's website? Peak. He 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 changed it from the crash course to now peakprosperity.com. That's right. Peak prosperity. Because yeah. uh, Chris is really trying to uh, put across the idea that uh, you know it, it it in shorthand that it's conceivable to thrive in the very different economy ahead. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean the death, demise, and, and hardship of everybody, but it probably will take some positioning for people to make the right decisions. Like, you know, if you decide you're going to move to Dallas, you know, probably not a good idea. You know, if you decide that you're going to plant some, uh, you know, fruit trees and have a garden on your property, that may be a better idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so on. Yeah, that's great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us and uh, just blessings on your work. I think it's just vitally Thanks. important. And um, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link and all the other information about this and, you know, how you can, uh, you know, you'll, you'll always have access to this interview and, and anybody okay. on your list and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'll look forward to it. And it's been a pleasure talking to you, Mike. Same here, Jim. <laughs>